When I introduce a speaker, if at all possible, uh, rather than reading their resume, which you can read in the program, um, I like to talk about the person as I know them and as, as my relationship evolves uh, with that person. Uh, and in fact, it was about five years ago um, that I reached out to um, a colleague of mine in New York, Scott Medbury, who was, the, uh, was at that time the CEO of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I said, you know, um, I'm going to London uh, to meet with some donors um, and to uh, um, begin to explore the possibility of um, having one of our peace symposiums um, in London. Uh, at that time, we were thinking in, in 2020 for the original launch uh, of the uh, Japan Institute. Um, in fact, we will be doing six peace symposiums on six continents over the next three years, beginning with Tokyo in September, London in December, next year in New York and Sao Paulo, Brazil, and then 2024 in Sydney, Australia, and Johannesburg, South Africa. And we wanted to uh, go to London first because um, as I, I talked about um, the, the lessons that we have of this garden with Japan is that we're a successful case study for creating peace at the intersection of culture, art, and nature, and how this community came to understand the Japanese in a different way um, through this garden over a long period of time. And um, my observation that in the last few years with so much anti-Islamic uh, and anti-Muslim sentiment in some of the capitals of Europe, including London, because of the acts of a few individuals putting sub uh, bombs in subways and such, um, that perhaps um, we could go our, and tell our story and there was an opportunity um, for London uh, as a city and as a people uh, to take lesson um, from uh, what we experienced here. And this concept that um, what if they were to build an Islamic garden in central London? Um, couldn't you, in fact, over time, just as we did here in Portland, begin to change attitudes of the people of London about the Muslim people um, through culture, art, and nature, as opposed to through doctrine or through what we see uh, in the media? Um, and so I could not imagine uh, going to London and having such a program um, without a, a partner like the Kew Gardens. Uh, and so Scott um, uh, in Brooklyn um, reached out uh, to Richard um, and uh, made an introduction for us and I went and um, this has begun a, a five-year friendship with a, a, a good colleague now. Um, we had a, a false start at planning the first uh, uh, symposium in 2020 um, and in fact, uh, Richard was set to speak uh, in Portland in March of 2020, literally the week that the entire world shut down. Uh, and it was one of these, uh, is it going to happen, is it not, and maybe we can still travel. And it, then it became clear that nothing was going to, no one was traveling and no one was going anywhere for a very long time. Um, and so we canceled that trip. And um, uh, he has been uh, just a great colleague who I, I've looked up to and I've learned a lot from this incredible institution and the change that he's made at this institution uh, over time. And to understand the similarities we have between our organizations, but also, more importantly, the differences uh, that we have and how we can learn from those differences. Um, and so he is, he's been a, a fantastic friend and colleague over the last five years, and I'm glad that we're finally able to welcome him here. Um, so please, uh, let's give a very warm or Portland, Oregon welcome to Mr. Richard Deverell. Steve, thank you. That's a, a very warm welcome, and thank you, uh, Jeannie, for your words as well. It is a great honor uh, and delight to be here addressing all of you today. Thank you for giving up part of your day to listen to what I have to say about the work we're doing at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. And I have to say, uh, I arrived in Portland on Friday. We've had a wonderful week in the Northwest. We flew into Seattle. We've explored the Olympic National Park, those glorious, huge trees, that wonderful, uh, globally important asset you have in that national park. And then we arrived at Portland on uh, Friday. And everyone's been so incredibly friendly. And I was at a wonderful event at the Japanese Garden last night, and I said how impressed I was by the quality of what that organization does and the importance of its mission, but also the vitality and the ambition uh, Steve and his team have in pushing it forward, in particular with the incredibly exciting uh, and interesting concept of creating the, the Japan Institute. So it's a great delight to be here today. I'm going to talk about three uh, themes illustrated by examples. The first is how we are trying at Q to make science engaging, accessible, and relevant to everyone. The second is the role of art in doing that. And the third is about broadening 
audiences and making sure Q is for everyone, uh, socially responsible and addressing responsibly aspects of our history, which at Q goes back a very long way. But before I covered any of that, I thought it might be worthwhile explaining what Q is, because I expect all of you think you know what Q is, and you will be partly right, but there's aspects to Q that you may not be familiar with. So I will start with that. So if I would say Q Gardens, uh, you would think of an image like this. This is part of the herbaceous borders at Q. Uh, one of two gardens that the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, the institution has. The second is a much larger estate in Sussex, actually. Q Gardens is a World Heritage Site. It's 330 acres in southwest London. And of course, it's famous for buildings like this. Uh, this is the Palm House. It was opened in 1848. It was the first of the big Victorian glass houses at Q. It's tropical. Uh, and it's one of about 50 uh, architecturally important historic buildings at Kew. So Kew has a tremendous amount of architecture and heritage apart from any of the plants. Of course, some of the audience will recognize the cherry tree here. This is, of course, a Yoshino cherry. We planted 37 of these with the Japanese ambassador in London about five years ago. So they're quite young, but the aim is to create a glorious tunnel in April of this uh, beautiful um, white with a hint of pink cherry blossom. You may, of course, think of plants, and you'll be right. Uh, Kew has nearly 20,000 different species of plants. It's possibly the most biodiverse spot on the world as a result of that. We don't really know. There are about 400,000 higher plants on the planet. So those are plants with internal plumbing, so not including mosses uh, or algae. Uh, so about 5% of the world's plant diversity exists at Kew. And you might be aware that we have galleries as well. We have two art galleries at Kew. This is the Victorian Marianne North Gallery. And certainly for anyone visiting Kew, this is an absolute gem. And it's oddly easy to miss. Marianne North, uh, she dutifully looked after her father until he died. She was then in her mid-40s. She was a single woman. This is the mid-19th century. She inherited some money. And she spent the next 30 years doing exactly what she wanted to do, which was to travel the world painting, and she committed her entire collection of paintings, about 830 oil paintings, to Q uh, in a gallery that she had commissioned and paid for, so an early example of philanthropy. And you see here some of the images arranged geographically, Singapore, South Africa, Ceylon, uh, America. She visited Yosemite, Lake Tahoe, but a truly remarkable gem. There's a modern art gallery, and we also have a 17th century palace where George III, who I believe was your last king, lived um, <laughs> with his 15 children. Uh, so, so there are many aspects to Kew beyond the gardens. One other is this, our science collections. Kew is what's known as a science, uh, sorry, a collections-based institution. In that sense, we're analogous to the Tate or the Victoria and Albert Museum or the, or the British Library or the British Museum, a collections-based institution. We have the most extraordinary botanical and mycological collections in the world. Uh, and these collections represent knowledge. They represent knowledge of plant and fungal diversity, and crucially, how that knowledge can be used to solve problems. And our challenge, of course, is to make these collections as accessible and as useful globally as possible. So just some examples, the bottom left image there is the um, plant DNA samples. We have samples of 50,000 species. Top left, microscope slides, the economic botany collection, very extensive library and art collection. Um, this is the mycological collection, the, the central lower image. And we also have the world's largest herbarium. A herbarium is a collection of dried plant specimens. And you see an example on the right here, the image on the left is uh, part of the Victorian wing built in 1877, which we think was the first purpose-built herbarium in the world. So it's a dried plant specimen, and think of them in aggregate as an inventory of plant life on Earth. It tells you this particular species was in this particular location at this particular time. And you can see the sort of information it contains. So in aggregate, it creates a picture of plant diversity both geographically and chronologically. And so, for instance, um, I was talking to some... Chinese plant scientists in Shanghai a few years ago, and they were hugely excited about our herbarium because it is the best source of knowledge of Chinese plant diversity, surprisingly. 
Um, much of the Chinese plants have been uh, destroyed, of course, in their natural habitat, but this is a historic record of what existed in China in the late 19th and early 20th century, much of which has gone. So this is a source of unique knowledge. You can also extract DNA from these historic specimens and thus construct the tree of life, i.e. the relationships or the interrelationships between plants based on these historic specimens. We have more than 300 scientists working at Kew, and they do a lot of work on uh, uh, researching plant and fungal characteristics, but also conserving plants. And Kew is the co coordinating body for something called the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership. Now, this is a global collaboration of about 120 organizations in about 100 countries, and the aim is to bank the world's plant seeds and to store them. So the seeds are gathered, they're desiccated, and they are frozen, and they are stored. And typically they're stored both at Kew, our facility uh, at Wakehurst in Sussex, and in the host country, Australia, for instance, or America. Um, we now have about 40,000 different species. And think of this in two ways, really. One is a gene bank for research. So when scientists at Cambridge University wanted access to the wild relatives of wheat to explore uh, aridity-tolerant variants of wheat, we had those wild relatives or their genomes in this seed bank. But of course, these are viable seeds. They will germinate. So it's also an insurance policy against extinction. Uh, and this really is, think of it as Noah's Ark, really, for seeds. There is no technical reason why any plant should go extinct through this sort of ex situ conservation project. And it has been described as the largest ex situ conservation project in the world. But we also do in situ, i.e. within a country, research and conservation. Uh, this image, for instance, is taken in the tropical forests of South America. And this particular plant is called Victoria boliviana. It's a brand new species of plant. Well, obviously the species isn't brand new, but newly described to science. It's been identified as a new species, one of three in the genus. This is the largest water lily in the world with pads of 3.2 meters across. And amazingly, it was only described to science this year, combination of horticultural and scientific work at Kew. Uh, and this is Carlos Magdalena, one of the uh, scientists involved in this in the, <laughs> in the field, as you can see, up to his chest in water. We maintain a permanent research base in Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar is of particular importance to anyone interested in conservation. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. The UN has described it as the poorest country in the world that is not currently at war. They've also said it's the country that's gonna be most affected by climate change. Up to 90% of the old growth forests have already been lost. So sadly, Madagascar in many ways has become a case study of the intersection of poverty, climate impact and biodiversity loss. Um, Q has a permanent research base there of about 40 people. It's where we train our uh, student scientists. And we've just started a new five-year, 10 million pound project looking specifically at biodiversity interventions that will, sustain, sus that will support sustainable livelihoods. So that intersection between conservation and sustainable livelihoods. Q's own work estimates that about 85% of all the plants in Madagascar are found only in Madagascar. They're endemic to Madagascar. So, of course, what that means is if they are lost in Madagascar, they are lost permanently. So this is a really urgent case study for conservation. So why does any of this matter? If I show you this image and I say to you, what do you see? I guarantee that almost everyone in this room will say, well, I see an orangutan. Uh, critically endangered Sumatran orangutan, one of humanity's closest living relatives. Um, but then I said, if you look again, what else do you see? And of course, what you then might say is, well, I see the forest in which that ape lives. And of course, that forest provides that ape with everything it needs, uh, food, shelter, water, uh, oxygen. And so at its very simplest, and this is one of the mantras at Q, all life depends on plants. You may not give a fig about plants, but if you care about charismatic animals, then you have to care about plants. <laughs> but unfortunately, we live in the age of extinction. Uh, some people think that's melodramatic language, but the scientists don't. The evidence supports this assertion. One in five species now faces extinction. Uh, unless urgent uh, action is taken, that will rise rapidly by the end of this century. And that is a broadly consensual view by the world's leading ecologists, uh, conservationists, and indeed the UN. This particular image is uh, the world's smallest water lily. We had the world's largest water lily a few slides ago. This is Nymphae thermarum. It was found only in one spot, a naturally occurring hot spring in Rwanda. The plants are now extinct in the wild, but they were saved from extinction uh, by some work from Kew scientists about a decade ago.
So nature is in crisis, and it will affect humanity. This lady is Professor Sandra Diaz. She was the lead author in the UN 2019 report on biodiversity. That report concluded that a million species face extinction. But she's also making the point that will affect humanity. And she has written extensively on COVID as a case study. The exploitation of wild animals and their unnatural proximity to humanity probably led to the global COVID crisis. And there can be no more powerful example of how damaging nature can damage humanity. So I think I'm often asked the question, well, why, why protect nature? Um, we face many, many critical issues uh, in the 21st century, many critical issues. You will be aware of them, of course. Why protect nature? And I think there are a number of different ways of answering this question, uh, and I will mention three briefly. The first you might call the utilitarian argument. This image, by the way, is of a tropical rainforest in Madagascar. And leaving aside its beauty and the extraordinary diversity, tropical rainforests are the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world. What you are seeing here is a machine that produces oxygen. Uh, plants also produce food. Uh, they produce vital materials, like the timber that's constructed this glorious theater. Uh, much of the rainfall that falls on US agriculture comes from transpiration from forests in South America. They provide clothing. My shirt is made of cotton. So very simply, all life depends on plants. At the most basic level, oxygen and food. Here's a good case study. Plants also provide us with medicine. The plant there, the little image, is called the rosy periwinkle. It's found in Madagascar. And this plant produces a very complex alkaloid. I've put up the molecular structure here. Anyone who briefly studied chemistry at school will realize just how complicated that molecule is. It's so complicated that until recently, it couldn't be synthesized. The only source was this plant, which is grown commercially. The reason being that this molecule and a closely related one called vinblastin is incredibly effective at treating childhood leukemia. Uh, and for many, many decades was the only source. And fortunately, tiny, tiny amounts, micrograms, are needed for the effective treatment of childhood leukemia. So amongst other things, plants are great chemists. And up to half of all our natural treatments for cancer, for instance, were originally derived from plants. So there's a utilitarian argument. We get things that matter to us from nature. And the UN has concluded that about 50% of the global economy is either partly or entirely dependent on nature. Pollinators, rainfall would be good examples. So there's the utilitarian argument, but I think there are two others. One is what I call the moral argument. This remarkable image was taken by one of the astronauts on Apollo 8, which you might recall was the first of the Apollo missions that actually went around the moon, didn't land on the moon. So for the first time, humanity saw Earth as that precious blue pearl from another planet, um, the moon, of course. Um, and you see the fragility and the solitude of that planet in space. There are about eight million species of plants, animal, and fungi on our planet. So that's before you get to the bacteria, the archaea, uh, and the viruses. Eight million species, but only one is causing all the damage. It's a bipedal ape that walked out of Africa about 60,000 years ago. And a writer called Mark Linus has described our species, Homo sapiens, allegedly thinking man, as the god species. And what he means by that is that we now hold in our hands the future of all life on Earth. We have become omnipotent, but not yet omniscient. And I think we have a moral responsibility to those other eight million species on this planet, and their destiny is literally in our hands. And finally, I think there's a humanitarian argument. I love this quote, uh, the inventor of the polio uh, vaccine. Our primary responsibility is to be good ancestors. We are currently failing on that measure. We should be aiming to leave our planet in a better state than we found it. And that's certainly what motivates me. So last year, we did a lot of work on Q strategy, our strategy for the period of 2030. We wanted it to be deliberately uh, ambitious, stretching. We wanted to look to the future. Um, I won't bore you with all the details. We came up with this simple mission statement to understand and protect plants and fungi for the well-being of people and the future of all life on Earth. Put another way, we're trying to align everything Q does towards the twin challenges of the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. And you might think, well, why the climate crisis? And uh, very simply, the climate crisis is one of the principal causes of biodiversity loss. Indeed, the UN think it will be the primary cause of biodiversity loss by the end of this century unless we change current trajectories. 
It's also the case that nature can mitigate a great deal of the biodiversity crisis. And increasingly, the UN is considering the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis as two sides of the same coin. They published a, last, a large report last year, for instance, on exactly that. We identified five priorities. Science is the biggest, the most important. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on number two, inspiring people to protect the natural world. Uh, put simply, we don't think that politicians and policymakers will act unless the public are concerned and galvanized by this subject. And number four, extend and broaden our reach. But you can see the other things we're trying to do. We have about 100, uh, well, it's about 150 now, MSc and PhD students working at Kew. Under number three, we have a school of horticulture. Some of our students come and study at the um, the Japanese garden here in Portland, for instance. Um, so today I'll focus on number two and number four, but just before I get to those, I wanted to leave this quote as well. This um, is from David Attenborough. I'm sure you are familiar uh, with his role in broadcasting and raising public awareness. He was a trustee of Q for many years and lives locally, and remarkably, aged 96, 97 now, is still regularly filming at Q Gardens. But I think this is exactly right. We've tried to infuse what we're doing at Q with a spirit of urgency or restlessness. Uh, and I think, uh, if anything, we have to accelerate that, not step back from that. So I've outlined what Q is, and I've outlined what we're trying to do and why it matters. I'll now touch upon those three themes I mentioned at the start, the first of which is how we make science engaging, relevant, and accessible. And of course, from everything I've said, it, it is utterly central to our purpose. And what we try and do at Q is to convey not just what we know, but how we know it and why it matters, the personal relevance to the individual. And at times also to try and explain to people what science is. I think a lot of people don't really understand what science is or the scientific method. The fact that it's based on evidence that is published and can be challenged. The fact there is no absolute truth, but it's constantly subject to revision. So science is different to religion. It's different to a political belief or an ethical belief. And trying to build public confidence in science and why you can trust it to find solutions, uh, I think is very important. Again, David Attenborough, one of his lines is, if people understand something, they're more likely to care for it. And if they care for it, they're more likely to protect it. So that causal chain, understand, care, protect, is very central to our thinking about how we communicate these messages. So I'll illustrate it with some examples. This building is the Temperate House. It's the largest Victorian glass house in the world, about 190 meters, grade one listed, uh, temperate, so the temperature shouldn't fall below about 10 degrees centigrade. This was reopened in 2018 after a five-year restoration, and clearly the bulk of the work was on the architecture, the heritage, and the planting. It has about um, 1,200 different species in it. But one aspect of the restoration was a new approach to interpretation. And in essence, what we wanted to do with all of the interpretation of this building was to tell contemporary stories of plant science and conservation and link those stories two big global themes. And usually, but not always, we illustrate the work that Q's own scientists are doing. So this chap top right is Dr. James Burrell, and he is working on climate resilient crops in Ethiopia. And the plant illustrated here, you see the size of it, is called NSAID. It's a wild banana, you don't eat the fruit, what you eat is the stem, and there's a big corm underground, which basically is a great big larder of carbohydrate. And the remarkable thing about this plant is that it's climate resilient. It doesn't fail when other plants fail, and you can keep it in the field until you need it. It doesn't have to be harvested at a particular time. So it's a buffer against hunger. It's a buffer against climate insecurity. And it was very striking that the areas of Ethiopia uh, that grew this plant in the 1980s did not suffer from the famine that afflicted other parts of Ethiopia. And what James is doing in partnership with colleagues at Addis Ababa University is looking at all the different variants, the genomics of these different variants of this wild banana to understand which cultivars are most effective in different climatic conditions and modeling that against future climate scenarios to build in climate resilience for the cultivation of this plant. Uh, and these are the sorts of stories we want to tell our visitors. Two years ago, three years ago now, 2019, we opened the Evolution Garden at Kew. And our aim here was to tell the story through planting of the evolution of plant life on Earth. So uh, plant life on Earth, on, on uh, terrestrial ecosystems, started about 500 million years ago. But flowering plants only appeared about 120, 130 million years ago. So for most of history, it was only green. Flowers appeared, this explosion. 
I think Darwin referred to it as an abominable mystery. It had this sudden diversity of plants appearing relatively recently in the geological record. And so this garden, which is quite extensive at Kew, it aims to tell the story of the evolution of plant life on Earth from the most simple forms, um, the horsetails, the ferns, etc., through to the most sophisticated forms, but also how we know that story. It's all based on genomic analysis, quite a, uh, a chunk of which was actually done at the adjacent labs at Kew. So the, the interpretation here is actually quite challenging, I would say. It's quite scientific. You have to lean in, you have to focus, you have to pay attention. There's quite a lot of detail. But you see people doing exactly that. And um, one of the phrases I have at Q is, I think if you boil the whole of Q down to two words, you get science and beauty. And this picture doesn't really do it credit, but the garden is also very beautiful, and it's a good amalgam of science and beauty, uh, or head and heart, if you like, in one location to educate people about the evolution of plant life on Earth. A different example is the children's garden. This was opened also in 2019. We decided to create a garden specifically for children, and our aim very simply was, if we're going to do that at Kew, we want it to be the best of its kind in the world. And I had this simple notion that children should nag their parents on Friday night. Please, Dad, can we go to Kew tomorrow? And I've got this hope that when I'm old and in the corner of a room rocking back and forth, I'll be listening to the radio and there'll be an eminent professor of, I don't know, molecular biology at Cambridge University, and they will say, as a child, my love of science was inspired by <laughs> visiting Kew. And, and, I, and although that sounds aspirational. I also think it's entirely credible. We want children to love nature. We want them to be curious about science. We want them to be uh, happy outdoors. So this garden is, it's one quarter education, I'd say three quarters fun. And it's designed, there's the overhead map here, it's designed around the four zones, the four things that all plants need. So air, light, water, and soil, designed for children aged 11 and younger. So you see an example here of the very, obviously, child-centric interpretation, the importance of light to plants and how lights convert through the magic of photosynthesis uh, electromagnetic radiation into carbohydrate. I have to say it's hugely popular. And as a philanthropic gift, of course, it's really useful for us because it drives visitors, it drives membership. One last brief example, something completely different. Um, we also try and communicate to policymakers and politicians. And after a truly remarkable soap opera, we ended up um, displaying this um, uh, display of nature-based solutions. So the role that plants and fungi can play in drawing down and storing carbon in soil, in plants, at the UN um, COP26, uh, the Climate COP26 in Glasgow last uh, November. And it was remarkable because it attracted a great deal of attention, not least because it was rather different to the other displays. And you can see this was, you're seeing about half of it here, some very prominent messages about the role of plants and fungi. There were real plants there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, scientists believe that nature can address about 30% of the carbon drawdown that is needed if we are going to successfully tackle climate change. Um, so it was a great opportunity for Q to raise its profile. It was also rather fun. We were in the UN Pavilion, and there were only four organizations in the UN Pavilion at COP26, and they were Bloomberg, Facebook, Google, and the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, <laughs> which I found very funny. Um, and the whole thing was sponsored by Bloomberg as well, so I'm very grateful to Mike and his team for that. Um, so that's just different examples of how we convey science. I was going to move on to art, uh, the second theme, the role of art in communicating these messages, but communicating them in a very different way. And it won't surprise you to hear that I believe that art can be an incredibly powerful way of communicating messages. You can appeal to heart as well as head. You can reach out to different sorts of audiences who would probably think, well, Q, yes, yeah, all very pretty, but not for me. You can draw them in by bold and ambitious programming using art. I also think that botanic gardens as a sector are very conservative, very risk averse. There's a slight sort of, well, it's not what we do, not for us, we'll do what we've always done. And I've always really tried to challenge that at Q. We've tried to learn from the best institutions in the world. And I often cite the VNA in London, if any of you have visited, as an organization that is really world class at using art to tell powerful stories. And I took my team to the Pink Floyd exhibition there, for instance, to see the scale and the intelligence of the storytelling that they were adopting. I also think there's tremendous scope for innovation in this area. 
we should be big, we should be bold, we should challenge expectations of what the organization can do. Our aim is to surprise people, to get them to reassess what Q is and why it matters and the role of botanic gardens. The phrase we use is perception shift, to shift the perception of what we are and what we do. So this image is something called the hive. Now the hive was a 17 meter high contemporary artwork that was commissioned originally by the British government for the World Expo in Milan. So it was one of about 80 national pavilions. And its purpose was to communicate the role of bees in pollinating plants and therefore feeding a hungry planet, which was the theme of the overall expo. We had long wanted to do something at Kew about insect-plant interactions, but we didn't know what to do, and it wouldn't have been big and exciting like this. And by a strange coincidence, I was reading the newspaper one day, and I read about this installation in Milan, and I went out and visited, and I thought, this would be perfect at Kew. There was then a saga. It took six months to persuade the British government that we should have this, but eventually they said we should have it, and we relocated it to Kew. Uh, so its purpose is to communicate the role of bees in pollinating plants and therefore feed a hungry planet. Um, I, I'm going to ask the chap if he could play a short video now because it captures better than this image what the hive is and how it sits in the landscape. So this, um, this opened at Kew in June 2016, and it was remarkable. Audience numbers jumped by 40% overnight, and it attracted a completely different audience to Kew, and I think it forced them to reassess what this organization was and what we were doing. The other thing I find remarkable about it is, and people are quite quick to complain at Kew, this is a World Heritage Site. And we, <laughs> plonked a large piece of bold modern art in it. But to date, I have never had a complaint about this. And I think even if people don't like the aesthetic themselves, they understand that its purpose is relevant to Q. Uh, the other thing that this achieved, I think, internally, Q had, had all sorts of problems. Um, I won't bore you with them. But this, this helped build a, a sort of foundation of confidence. It showed we could do big and ambitious things and do them well and succeed. And, and it helped us build momentum within the organization. A few other examples, a local artist, if Seattle counts as local, a wonderful exhibition, Dale Chihuly's work in 2019. As you know, his work is entirely inspired by nature. It looked absolutely stunning, particularly at night. These are forms that are inspired in particular by plants, botanical shapes, and it sits very, very well uh, outside in the landscape, but also in the glass houses. Um, this exhibition led to our highest ever audiences at Kew, just under 2.3 million in uh, 1920. Again, a very significant jump up. And of course, people come to see Dale Chihuly, but then they'll go into the Evolution Garden, they'll go to the Children's Garden, they'll go into the Palm House. So it draws people in uh, as a very powerful way of extending our reach. And our current exhibition this summer is called Food Forever. It's all about food security, uh, providing accessible nutrition for all, affordable nutrition for all. And you might think, well, why Q? Well, food is the number one benefit that arguably, arguably plants provide for humanity. 
But agriculture is also the number one cause of biodiversity loss. The conversion of natural ecosystems to agriculture is also a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. And food security is a global challenge. There's a stunning statistic from the Food and Agriculture Organization that despite the fact that about 7,000 plant species are edible, we, humanity, derive about 50% of our calories from just three species, rice, maize, and wheat. So we're dangerously reliant on this slender thread of genetic diversity at a time, of course, of climate change when some of these crops are starting to fail, the maize crop in Africa, for instance. So this particular installation, there are about five in total. This is from a Ghanaian artist called Serge Atukwe Clote, and this celebrates a harvest festival in Ghana called uh, Homowo. But his work, and, and obviously you can't read the interpretation around it, um, uh, that harvest festival is starting to be challenged in Ghana because climate change is affecting the timing and the nature of their agriculture and is causing significant problems, including uh, migration because of climate change. This is another of those installations. This is by an artist called Sharp and Sour. This is more museum-like. This talks a lot about the choices we face as consumers, the impact on environment, the impact on biodiversity. Um, for instance, the fact that beef is probably 30 times more demanding as a kilogram of protein compared to plant protein in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So this exhibition really helps to uh, uh, convey some basic images, uh, sorry, basic information to our visitors. And this one is very much at the wacky end of the spectrum. This is an Australian artist called Tanya Schultz. And what she's tried to convey here is a sort of fantasy world of food. Its aim is to challenge perceptions about our own consumption, what food is and what it can be. Um, this is in the modern art gallery we have. I mentioned we have two. And this is about as radical as Q is currently getting. But it really is, it's quite interesting to watch people step into this and see their reaction when they see this sort of lurid, saccharine world of food. So my third theme is about broadening audiences, acknowledging our history, and seeking to be socially responsible. Now, Q is both a charity and an arm's length body of government, and the latter means that we get about 30% of our funding from government, about 70% we earn ourselves. But I think partly because we're reliant on general taxation, partly because we're a charity, I think we have a moral obligation to be for everyone, to broaden reach as much as possible. But of course, this is a real challenge. Like many um, uh, art, science institutions, botanic gardens around the world, our demographics default generally to an older, uh, more affluent, more tertiary educated, whiter audience. And yet London, of course, is an extremely diverse place. 50% um, ethnic minority now uh, in London. So very diverse community and also issues great wealth, but great poverty as well. So the first thing I'd say on this subject is that Q is absolutely saturated with history. For about 200 years, Q as an organization was completely central to the imperial endeavor, including uh, slavery and other aspects of our imperial history. This image is of our main gate. So this dates from the 1840s. And I put it up here simply because I think for many people approaching this gate, and actually this image, the gates aren't even open, this is slightly daunting. This is history, this is heritage, this is Victorian, this is imperial. And I know from speaking to some of our own staff who perhaps come from uh, working class backgrounds, north of England, ethnic minority backgrounds, that they approach this and they think, this organization is not for me. I love plants, I love nature, but, but not this place. And so our very heritage slightly mitigates against this uh, desire to be welcome and accessible to many. And what you don't see on this image is that there's a very big wall, you just see the edge of it on the left there, that extends for over a mile, that's about 12 feet high, that sort of tacitly says, keep out. So we have a challenge here. Just to go back a little bit in history, uh, this is the lady who started the botanical collections in 1759, Princess Augusta. She was the mother of George III. She set aside five acres for an arboretum of exotic, i.e. foreign trees. And about four or five of those trees are still at queue, including a ginkgo and a, a robinia from uh, America. And this man, in effect, was my predecessor. He was, in a way, the first director of Kew, Sir Joseph Banks, a remarkable man. Uh, he was the scientific advisor to George III, who lived at Kew. Uh, he was president of the Royal Society 40 years. He accompanied Captain Cook on his first voyage around the world between 1768 and 1771. And he masterminded the flow of economically important plants all around the empire, so rubber, quinine, sugar, um, he envisaged Kew as a global clearinghouse for empire. 
So much of Kew's purpose, yes, it was science, but science with an economic purpose, economic botany, where value and wealth uh, lay. He was involved, for instance, in commissioning the bounty, which was taking breadfruit from Southeast Asia as a cheap and affordable food for the slaves in the Caribbean. And of course, there was the famous mutiny. Kew people were on that boat, and they stayed on the main ship. They threw the officers into the little boat, and it didn't end well for them. Um, so, so, I mean, I say all this simply to say that Kew cannot and should not escape its history. I think more than any other of the great British institutions, like the British Museum or the, or the um, or the VNA, this 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 uh, imperial history, uh, economic history, was absolutely central uh, to Q. So we announced two years ago that we were going to do some work to decolonize our collections. And little did I know when we said that that we had lit the blue touch paper. Does that phrase resonate with you? When you light a firework, you light the blue touch paper and it goes bang. Um, <laughs> Uh, and what we meant by that, actually, I think is very simple. We wanted to improve access, uh, global access, so digitizing collections, for instance, making sure we published our scientific work in, in languages relevant to the, the, the audiences that would find them most useful, joint curation of collections. So improving access was one theme. Acknowledging contribution, for instance, we hadn't done enough to acknowledge the vital role of indigenous people and local collectors, not just in identifying plants, but describing their uses and benefits. Quinine, for instance, in the jungles of South America, there are about 30 different species of quinine, but there is one that the locals say is best for treating malaria. The European plant collectors sent out by Q would have never known that without the knowledge of the locals how we work as well. For example, we're going to develop a repatriation policy just so we have a transparent process. If anyone, and we don't get many requests, but if anyone requests something to be repatriated from Q's collections to an indigenous community, at least we have a transparent process for considering that. But I have to say, uh, we completely underestimated how controversial all this was. We have our own version in the United Kingdom of the culture wars. And I completely underestimated how lively uh, this debate was or how contentious that word decolonizing is. We have also always charged entrance to Q. It's just a historic thing. It goes back more than 100 years. Um, but we wanted to try and get to a point where on the one hand, of course, we had to protect our income, but we wanted to get to a point where no one was denied access on the basis of affordability. So earlier this year, we started something that was really simple and made us think, well, why don't we do this I don't know, a decade ago, whereby anyone on government credit schemes, so in the UK that's called universal credit or pension credit, can get in for just one pound. And the normal entrance is about 19 pounds, so a very significant reduction. Um, and the assumption was that these people can't afford to come in now, so we weren't losing any income. It wasn't as if they were buying tickets. We had 10,000 people take advantage of that in the first few months, but I think that's a number we should aim to grow to 100,000. And we want this message to get out that Q is for everyone. No one should be denied access on the basis of affordability. So we're aiming for 100,000 a year on these one pound tickets. But of course, we've also got to make sure that we have programs that appeal to different people. And we've always had programs at Q. We've always had particular exhibitions or events that try and draw people in. Uh, the top left image was the Japan Festival last October. The bottom right is the February Orchid Festival. This one uh, last year was Costa Rica. But we need to make sure some of those programs are uh, going to really resonate with the communities that we would like to attract to Q that are currently not visiting. So we're doing a Mexico festival uh, this autumn, for instance, and at some point I'd love to do something around Ethiopia or East Africa, uh, for instance, but using our programming in a much more structured and focused way to draw in particular audiences. And of course we have to make sure that everyone feels welcome when they are there. And then just briefly, we do a mixture of local outreach and national outreach. There's a whole series of projects here. Um, these relate to homeless people, um, uh, immigrants, um, people that don't speak English. The use of plants in creative writing is the middle image. The top right image is a local project for people that are alone and disconnected from society. It brings people together to learn skills and to make social connections in the local community. Um, the image with the, the young woman there um, with the white um, headdress. This is a great initiative called uh, Youth Explainers, where we bring in a group of about 20 young adults between about 15 and 18, and we train them in plant knowledge and also how to communicate. And they work at the gardens over the weekend talking to our visitors about plants and why they matter. And it builds confidence, it builds communication skills and knowledge of plants and science, of course. 
And for about a decade, we've had a national outreach project going called Grow Wild. And this, is, um, this taps into community projects all around the country where you can bid for different levels of support to grow wildflower meadows uh, and to engage uh, different communities in horticulture. So the image, um, top, the, the left-hand image, is of a, a resident-led community garden in South London, for instance, that's being supported by this national outreach. So the very simple point is that we know, of course, you know, Q is in one location, but we want to try and have a national program. We need to do a lot, a lot more in this area. The bottom right image, if you're wondering what that is, we created this giant fungi, um, and it's been on tour. It's been to all sorts of music festivals, universities. <laughs> Um, it's a great sort of squidgy latex thing, and it absolutely fascinates people, but it talks about the role of fungi in cycling nutrients. And finally, of course, the stories that we tell. Um, you might not be able to read this, but it talks about um, relevant historic events, uh, relevant to Q's history, that is. So this talks about the Opium Wars in the 19th century and how Britain's victory in those wars forced China to open up and in turn that led to a whole series of plant hunting expeditions which in turn led to the movement of Chinese plants all around the world, ornamental and economically important plants. So where relevant to Kew's history, and this is in an area of the gardens called the China Grove next to the 18th century Chinese pagoda, we talk about aspects of history that are relevant to Kew's plant science and plant, uh, plant movements. Um, so we don't shy away from aspects of imperial history when it is relevant to Q's purpose and narrative. So that is it. Um, in conclusion, I think there are global and universal challenges that Q is trying to uh, tap into, particularly, of course, the extinction crisis and the climate crisis. No one on the planet will be unaffected by these two. And we're trying to position Q uh, to provide solutions to those and therefore to illustrate its relevance to humanity, a global outlook. And science and conservation, therefore, is at the heart of everything we do. And you've seen with some of the examples, and I could have given others, how I believe that bold art, being ambitious and innovative, can really make a difference. It can broaden audiences, it can change perceptions. But you have to be willing to take risks. There is a degree of uh, um, uh, innovation required and a degree of confidence required to push it through. And what I've learned is that you have to go big, I think, and be bold. You have to challenge assumptions about what the organization is and what audiences will tolerate. You have to surprise them. And I also believe, and it was touched upon by that quote by uh, David Attenborough, there is an urgency. We have to do more. We have to raise our game because the clock is ticking. Thank you.